Hi. Going down. First time in history. Bring somebody in the elevator with me. So I'm in Houston largely because of Dr. DeBakey. He's probably the single most influential cardiovascular surgeon that ever existed and I really came down here to interview because I wanted to meet Dr. DeBakey. I really had no intention of actually taking the job and then leaving. I loved working at Methodist. Methodist is easily the best healthcare organization that I've ever worked in. Number one, they take great care of the patients. Number two, they take great care of their, their, their staff and the personnel who actually work there. Lots of people wear boots when they operate. I'm not one of them. I mean, perhaps that shows that uh, I'm not a true Texan by nature, is that everybody says how comfortable cowboy boots are. I guess I've never quite found a pair of boots that fit me quite yet because I do not find that. I'm a, I'm a Donald Pliner shoe guy because those are the most comfortable shoes I've ever worn in my life. And you know, if you told me I'd wear uh, designer shoes, I, I would have laughed, but they are incredibly comfortable. You get this beautiful flyover, what do we, you're up in the sky. I feel like you're in the clouds here at the moment. We're now on University Avenue during one of the storms. I had to park in Rice Village, which is behind us, and there's a walking down this thing knee deep in water. And when you look at these roads, you don't realize that there's actually a slope to these roads. I can tell you the shallowest place is right in the middle where those yellow lines are. Because uh, it's treacherous walking along these sidewalks. I think one of the things I'm most excited about is our educational programs, and, and they are really top line in terms of pick amongst the top people in the nation for all the different programs. And we've supplemented that by building an organization I'm very proud of, and that's Dubakey Cardiovascular Education. That was really founded by a grant from the Dubakey Foundation. It allowed us to build these programs, such as this YouTube channel. We film talks that are given, we film a lot of the cases, and you know, there's probably two and a half thousand videos. We continue to add to that all every day. And you know, we now have 66,000 subscribers around the world. And it's all free. And so I think it's a major contribution. TMC, I think we're here. Dr. DeBakey was a fast driver and had fast cars. I don't exactly know what his cars were, but he's legendary from driving from here to what's called the Annex at 70, 80 miles an hour before he went past Holcomb. The great story about Dr. DeBakey was he got stopped by the cops one day. The cops said, do you know what you're driving, what speed you're doing? And he said, do you know who I am? And the story is that the cops said, well, I don't care if you're Denton Cooley, you're getting a ticket. <clears throat> well, Denton Cooley and DeBakey were big rivals, as you probably are aware. <laughs> that didn't go down so well. Routine. Life. Call us the Dr. Jimmy House, Tim. Yeah, let me see which side we're doing left side. During the week, we're always kind of seeing. You know, part of being an academic surgeon is what's the next big development in the cardiovascular world. And part of the stimulation of that is surrounding yourself by people who are very curious about how things can be done better than they are at the moment. And that's really what drives us is what's the next new device or what's going to be the next new procedure that can be evolved. You're surrounded by engineers. One of the exciting things that's happening here that this audience will be very interested in is the new medical school we started called NMED, Engineering and Medicine. You've got to be an engineer to get into it. There's kids who all have an engineering background, who are all uh, innovators and looking to be entrepreneurs to get a dual degree, and they come on our services. And so these are just phenomenal people to work with because the engineers are the ones who actually solve the problems. We can identify the problems, but in my world, uh, cardiovascular world, they're the ones who actually help solve the problems. 
course, kept secret around. That's uh, where the keys are. <coughs> It's this chair, it's from Relax the Back, man, it is the best, oh, it's the best thing ever. You can grab a couple of seats between cases, weight off, weight, weight off your feet. Oh, I'm a big believer in the snooze, keeps you going. You've got a great view out of my office, that's Rice, and then Rice Stadium over there, and I always tell people, our conference room looks over there. When we interview people, I always say, name me the two things that happen in Rice Stadium. One they don't know about, and one they do know about. One they don't know about Super Bowl VIII actually was played in Rice Stadium. The one they know about, but don't realize that's where it was, is that's where John F. Kennedy gave the moonshot speech. We go to the moon not because it's easy. But because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone. And one we intend to win. So again, it stimulates me every day to look at Rice Stadium and think of uh, the moonshot speech that was given there. And you know, Houston's a remarkable place. And when I was coming down here from Emory, I was very well aware that NASA was here. And clearly knew about the legacy of Houston in the energy business. You know, it's not so much steps as standing. You know, standing is the worst thing you can do. As you're standing, blood pulls in your legs, and your legs swell, and you're standing beside an operating room, and you know, four or five hours at least, you know, a day. Uh, that's kind of one of the problems that occurs. What, what's the agenda today? <laughs> Didactics, okay. This is our residence. What they're doing is we have a patient list, and essentially what they're doing is running through the entire patient list, so all the residents know what is going on with each patient. Because uh, there's team transitions that take place, really, from the last night team to the team that's going to be around today, and so uh, that's basically what they're doing. It's making sure everybody's on the same page. One of the big issues in medicine is communication. We have several. Educational conferences, we're about to go to case conference. Uh, that's where, you know, there are usually two or three cases that are presented, but from here and around the Methodist system by our residents of unique cases or cases that have a very uh, important educational component to it. Ask your case conference an opportunity to go in depth into interesting cases that have been done. And so it gives us a lot more time than you necessarily have in the operating room to kind of explore uh, thought process in terms of why an operation is done, what are the interoperative complications that we're trying to avoid, and then it also gives multiple attendings the opportunity to say how they do it. All right, and text message says we're ready. That means they're ready in the operating room, and so time to head on over there. Well, Dr. Dubicki was somebody who was certainly on the cutting edge of technology. But some of the first satellite transmissions and, re and case recording were actually done by him and our old friend and Brian O'R. So, obviously, the technology has come a long way. Uh, but you know, I think we like to think we're doing the same kind of principles, and that is using we call it high-end technology, but with good old-fashioned common clinical sense, and so or clinical common sense, and so. Uh, we're really interested in new technology, but a lot of it has to be couched with the appropriate use. 
make you five years as a resident, and of course you knew him for decades until he finally passed away. I was telling him the ICU legendary story. Yeah. Is it urban legend or is it real? No, it's real. I lived in the <laughs> ICU for two months. My wife was seven months pregnant with my second daughter. My first daughter was two and a half years old. She'd come up every Saturday with clean socks and underwear. I'd see her for an hour and then they'd go home. And I'd see her the next Saturday. There was a red line on the floor. If you stepped across it, you got fired. Yeah, no, I remember I'd heard about the red line. Yeah. Far away in Atlanta. I just assumed it was not real until I came down here. I was no, no, no. and looked down one day and down the red line. No, the red line, you looked, there was a back hall. It had, it had six rooms on it for the people that were infected or not never going to make it. My room was the last in that line of rooms. <laughs> but you made it. But I made it, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a perfect segue. Yeah. All right, thank you. One of the reasons I moved to Houston was because this was a city that was built on big, open cardiovascular operations. The aorta is a big blood vessel comes out of your heart, essentially. Every blood vessel in your body comes off it. And that's really what this place was legendary for, is diseases of the aorta. And one of the things that had been missed, because they were so proficient at that, was this change to minimally invasive therapy where we actually work inside the blood vessels uh, and reline the inside of those pipes, if you like, rather than cutting you open, replacing the pipe. And so that was a revolution. And when I came down here to visit, it was interesting because they were so dominant in doing the open operation, they really kind of missed this transition. And so that was one of the reasons that I was recruited and came down here, is to try and help make that transition. And so, but, you know, there was some skepticism about whether that was the right thing to be doing. And I remember one day, uh, Dr. Dubeke called me up and he would know, say, what are you doing now? And I'd say, the answer was always nothing, sir. What can I do for you? He said, can you come up here? And so I went up to his office and he showed me a CAT scan and it was a patient who had an aneurysm of the descending thoracic aorta. And he said, can you put a sten graft in that? Honestly, I wasn't sure what the right answer was supposed to be. But the right answer was, yes, sir. And I believe that's eminently treatable with a sten graft. And then he looked at me and said, you know, we developed that open operation here. I said, yes, sir, I'm, I'm very well aware of that. And he said, but you know what? That's a big operation, there's lots of complications. If there's a more minimally invasive way of doing this, I think that's what we should be doing in this patient. And I think that was really the measure of the man was that he was, again, always looking, despite the fact that he really was one of the pioneers in developing the traditional therapy, was always looking for the, the next leap into how we can maintain the core part of that operation, but diminish the magnitude of the physiologic insult to the patient. And yeah, I think that's part of our core values to this day is that we, we don't want to throw the old way out because it's been tested over time and it's a matter of how can that be tweaked so we maintain the efficacy of the procedure while changing the way we actually deliver the therapy. One of the more fun things that an academic surgeon gets to do is participate in educational programs. And one of the ones that we're doing today is probably one of the more exciting things. It's an experiment. It's called uh, Mighty XR. We're looking at robotics and virtual reality. And so I'm going to join Stuart Core here in the studio. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. You ready? Oh, yeah. This is going to be a tightly packed agenda. Well, Stuart, yeah. first of all, thank you. And thank you all for joining. Uh, you know, my thanks go to Stuart specifically for taking what is a concept to become a reality. And here's really the idea. We, we really think that we're one of the foremost imaging centers with the relationship we have with Siemens. And we are very interested in surgical robotics. The holy grail is really to take imaging and integrate it into these robotics platforms. So this is really the first step in a multi-year journey of building this concept that we have of integrating imaging into robotics and we hope that you'll come along with us for that journey so thank you again for joining us thank you again Stuart for uh, helping host this put it together and then host it today this is what I should have done is left it on as it dries up and gets really, really tough. Get 
big trouble if I lose the dog, I tell you. All right, let me get a jacket. The solitude, quiet totally different from what you normally do on a daily basis. But fishing is also kind of technical. It's all about the, the gear and the technique, believe it or not. Not that I'm very good at it. But so for example, there are different ways of fishing. You can fish the bottom, which you put a lead weight on it and you know, put shrimp and you, you get the fish who feed on the bottom. Or you can shrimp with what's called a bobber where there's a float out there. So what probably most people do. And so they, it keeps the bait off the bottom so you don't get all, you call the trash fish down there. Or you can use something like this. And you, you basically, the idea is you pop it up and it flutters down, pop it up and flutters down. You catch a flounder, you think you've got who you're hooked on the bottom. It's this dead weight that you're pulling up. That's not what happens with a redfish. A redfish just hits the bait and starts running. And so you, it's that kind of, when you hear that whee, when the reel is pulling line off the reel. That's what a redfish would sound like. <laughs> 